Okay, so now we have the afternoon session, and uh, it will be Professor Shomriti Shankar Rai speaking on the decimated Navier-Stokes equation. Okay, so uh, let me begin by uh, thanking the organizers. Uh, Shomitra is here, uh, uh, Pranay, Nilima, uh, Amit, and and their team, Shomdatta, etc., for organizing this uh, very nice uh, yearly meeting and for allowing me to speak every year, although uh, very often, as is the case today, what I'm going to talk about is a, a little away from the focus of this meeting, uh, but certainly the birds, chaos, uh, networks, etc., of course, have come up, and certainly it's a complex problem. So since uh, this is not really a turbulence meeting, I'll try to uh, sort of give a general uh, overview of what the sort of key question is, uh, that some of us have been uh, uh, worrying ourselves with, uh, and uh, that some of us sort of includes a, a, a long list of uh, students and collaborators who've contributed uh, at different stages of this problem. So let me begin uh, by a preamble. The, the, the good thing is that in last year's meeting, Joint Gotchaj gave a set of lectures on this very topic, which was the following. So in general, if one looks at a turbulent flow, either experimentally or theoretically, the starting point is the Navier-Stokes equation. And then in the early 1940s and the late 1930s, uh, Kolmogorov came up with one rationalization of how to understand uh, turbulence. So this is sort of, you know, one small aspect of the full problem. It has nothing to do with uh, uh, that you may have heard of, like uh, boundary layer or finite time blow up, etc. It's a simple question, and it's the following. If I have a stationary homogeneous turbulent flow, for example, in the middle of a wind tunnel, if you were to do an experiment or if you have a measuring device in, in, in deep ocean or you send a balloon up in the sky, and you ask yourself the question, what is the distribution of kinetic energy in various Fourier modes. So essentially, you're calculating what would be called as the energy spectrum. And Kolmogorov uh, showed, uh, you know, using arguments which were largely phenomenological and they were revised in the 1960s, <coughs> that, for example, if you were to measure the energy spectrum, the distribution of kinetic energy in Fourier modes, they should obey a scaling law which goes as k minus 5 third in a certain sort of band of wave numbers. Furthermore, uh, Kolmogorov also, and this is really a consequence of what Kolmogorov started with, what he, he asked the rather simple question, which is, if I have a measuring device and I'm allowed to measure the velocity of the fluid at some point x, and I'm allowed to measure the velocity of the fluid at another point x plus r, and then I take the difference of these two velocities, then that velocity difference should scale as r to the power zeta p, all right? And the dimensional or, or the Kolmogorov way of uh, working this out would suggest that this exponent is rather simple and it scales as p by 3. So you can, of course, look at the case when p equal to 2, which is the inverse Fourier transform of this object, and you see that it indeed satisfies the fact that the second order correlator has an exponent 2 third is completely consistent with the energy spectrum having an exponent minus 5 third. They're just Fourier transforms of each other. All right, so this was uh, sort of the framework for turbulence for a long time. And uh, certainly at the level of the second order uh, correlation functions, the scaling seems to be reasonably good, both in experiments and numerical simulations. All right. However, when, you know, over the years, especially in the 70s and 80s, when wind tunnels became more and more accessible and slowly computers started to uh, creep into uh, our, our lives, uh, people actually solved the Navier-Stokes equation or did more refined experiments and found that this p by 3, so here I'm plotting zeta p versus p, the p by 3 ought to be a straight line as shown by this dashed line. What people found was that when they actually measured these exponents, they deviated strongly from the Kolmogorov prediction. And at the heart, and, and the reasons for these deviations are still debated, and the general sort of word that people in turbulence like to throw around is, oh, there is intermittency, and hence you have deviations. 
I'll, 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 I'll come to this definition a little, uh, make it a little more precise as we go along. What they essentially mean is that if you look at the PDF of the velocity difference, this object, they are not Gaussian. If they were Gaussian, then the linear scaling would follow. There are actually things which are far from Gaussian, which have fat tails, which have you know, extreme statistics, so you can have very large uh, velocity differences with a finite probability, and all that is clubbed under this one word, intermittency. Again, if you were to do an experiment, for example, and you were to measure the amount of energy which is being dissipated in your turbulent flow as a function of time, you will end up getting you know, reasonably quiescent behavior and then sudden spikes which are distributed all over the place. So these are sort of, you know, all I'm trying to say is, you know, uh, if this is the sort of only message in turbulence that one should uh, take home, is the fact that turbulent flows uh, deal with what are known as intermittent structures, structures which cannot be in any way sort of captured using uh, models such as Kolmogorov or Gaussian approximations. All right, so for, for, for many years, uh, intermittency has been sort of the holy grail in this problem, and people have tried several approaches to understand this. However, if you sort of ask yourself, is intermittency, in the sort of loose way that I defined, which is things are no longer Gaussian, uh, is that the only fingerprint of a turbulent flow? So here I'm sort of making it slightly, uh, you know, cartoonish and, and sort of trying to advocate that there are actually three fingerprints uh, of, of a flow which is turbulent. A, it's chaotic, and I'll come back to these ideas in a bit. So what it means, I mean, we've had many talks which had the word chaos in it. What it essentially means is that you'll have positive Lyapunov exponents, for example. Uh, B, uh, that it's irreversible. That's, again, not surprising. That's because you have a little dissipation, and of course, you know, that, that, that would seem to suggest that uh, the flow would be irreversible. So if you run a movie forward and backward, you will not see the same thing. And, and lastly, intermittent, which I've talked about, but let me sort of point out uh, what would be a visual manifestation of this, so we have some ideas in our head. For example, if you were to look at these vorti vortices in a turbulent flow, and that's a picture uh, of that, you see that there are regions of very strong vortices, which, you know, that's the green region, which are sort of at the interface of regions which have very little vortices, which are black regions. All right? I mean, there are issues about whether this is a self-similar behavior or not, but, you know, uh, maybe we can discuss this at the end if necessary. For example, if you were to look at the acceleration statistics, what I mean is take a little blob of dye in a fluid, in a turbulent flow, and trace and, and sort of record its acceleration as a function of time, and you construct a PDF. What you end up finding is that PDF has huge fat tails again. So there is a reasonably finite probability that a turbulent flow will have accelerations which are many, many times larger than their RMS values. All right? So, so all of this sort of, you know, over the last 20 years or so, there have been various characterizations which have confirmed without explaining, and uh, this talk again, will not explain because we don't have the answers, but which have characterized turbulent flows having these three, essentially, telltale signatures. All right. So what has been the approach, you know, beyond experiments and numerical simulations to understand some of these features, all right? So historically, what people have worked in with are models, so these are more post-factor rationalizations of observations, on models which have been based on the velocity field, on models which have been based on the dissipation structure. So you look at the statistics of dissipation and then try to construct models uh, which will sort of mimic them. Uh, then there have been, uh, you know, simpler models which uh, were very, you know, uh, in the 80s, which were known as shell models, and I'll sort of allude to this in a bit. And of course, the most famous of them all being the Kreitner model, which, uh, which works for a certain passive scalar problem. So all of these are models which have essentially tried to explain why, in one word, the scaling exponent is not P by 3, okay? But none of these are microscopic models. Again, I'm not going to present a microscopic model because we don't have one, but I'm going to show a nice experiment which sort of uh, 
hopefully uh, will be uh, interesting. Okay, so a new approach which was developed was uh, what is known as fractal decimation, and I'll come to that in a, in a second and define it more precisely. Uh, the only thing that I would like to, uh, you know, uh, like people to keep in mind is that with this approach, we deal directly with the Navier-Stokes equation, unlike the previous approaches, all right? So what is this idea? So I've talked about Navier-Stokes and turbulence, so let me sort of flash the Navier-Stokes equation, which can be written in any dimension d. It could be 2 or 3, which is the usual laboratory or uh, uh, natural setting case. That's the Navier-Stokes equation. That's the famous nonlinearity, and you have the little viscous coefficient sitting there. Now, you can expand uh, the solution in this Fourier basis, all right? So people who do simulations uh, sort of are always using this game, all right? So you can write down the velocity field in terms of all its Fourier modes. Now, what we do is we sort of... So this is, for example, a cartoon of a Fourier lattice. So that's, let's say, if it's in 2D, that's KY and KX. Now, what I do is randomly, and I'll define the protocol uh, more precisely later, I scoop out some of these Fourier modes and ensure that there is no dynamics on, this mode, on those modes. Those modes are dead for all practical purposes, uh, not in the sense of uh, the talks before the lunch session, but in, 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 in the sense of there is no dynamics on those, uh, on those lattice points. So what that means is I expand the velocity field on a Fourier basis, but I now multiply each Fourier mode by a, uh, by a parameter gamma, where gamma has the value of either 1 or 0. All right? And whether it has 1 or 0 is, you know, is described with a certain probability. Okay? So in a sense, this is, you know, to give another example, this is like introducing a quenched disorder in your Fourier lattice. Quenched because I take this mask at t equal to 0, and I preserve this lattice for all time, all right? Some subtle issues with this at the end, which if we have time, we can discuss. All right, so with this expansion, I now have the Navier-Stokes equation, but written on this projected subspace. So this, if you will, is a generalized Galerkin projection. Essentially, what it means, the good news is that if you had certain invariants or conserved quantities in the original equation, you preserve all those conserved quantities on application of this projector. Yes, Shitapra? Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll come to the rational in the next slide, which is why bother. Okay, <laughs> so, so I'll come back. In case the question isn't answered, just come back and ask me again, okay? All right. Uh, okay, so, uh, so what I was uh, stressing on is that although we have sort of played fast and loose with the underlying lattice on which the flow evolves, the Fourier lattice, we nevertheless, because of the construction of this Hermitian operator, we nevertheless preserve all the invariances of the problem. So as a statistical physicist, you're happy that you haven't broken any of the symmetries or the conserved quantities, all right? So now, how do you choose this gamma k? So there are two ways to do it. One is what Chitabra was suggesting, which is you do it randomly. So you assign a certain probability, 0 0.5, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, what you will. Go to each Fourier mode and decide whether that will live or not with that probability. The other is a fractal way where you introduce a new dimension. So you began with a lattice either in 2D or 3D. It doesn't matter which dimension. Let's call that uh, capital, uh, th let's call that small d. Now you start removing modes in a scale invariant way so that the effective lattice is now a, of a dimension capital D which is smaller than the original dimension. So for example, if you begin with 3D and you want to create an effective lattice of dimension 2.5, let's say, all you do is you choose this probability factor, scale sk to the power 2.5 minus 3, all right? Okay, now, uh, you know, answering uh, Shitapra's question, why did we sort of even try to enter this game? After all, it's hard to imagine a, a, a sort of... Uh, 
non-integer dimensional uh, turbulent flow in the lab, right? So uh, the reason one entered that game is because, uh, you know, uh, starting with the work of Mark Brashe, uh, Pumir and others, uh, in the last 10 years, what we have been seeing is that there is actually some merit in looking at equilibrium solutions. It sounds crazy because I'm dealing with non-equilibrium systems such as turbulent flows, but there is some merit in looking at equilibrium solutions versus non-equilibrium solutions of the Navier-Stokes equation. How do you get there? So here's a little sort of flowchart to get there. So one can begin with the Navier-Stokes equation, PDE, infinite degrees of freedom, and the counterpart, which is the Galerkin truncated inviscid one. So this is the real Galerkin truncation where you set all modes beyond the wave number to be zero. All right? <clears throat> So the conservation laws for both these systems are the same. In two dimension, it's energy and entropy. In three dimension, it's just energy. All right? However, this object is, now has a nice Hamiltonian structure, and this object has a finite dimensionality. All right? So you can invoke Louisville's theorem. You can invoke Gibbsian distributions. And then what you see is that if you look at the sort of the infinite degree problem, the Navier-Stokes, then you have the usual famous either the K minus 5 third Kolmogorov type behavior in 3D turbulence or in 2D turbulence where you have the dual cascade. All right? However, if you were to solve the fully truncated version of this problem, then you end up with equipartition regime, which in, two, which in 3D, for example, grows as K squared. It's actually quite interesting that Hopf and Lee just after Kolmogorov's work, actually published this result and said that K squared is the spectrum for turbulence, all right? Whereas all results seem to suggest it's K minus 5 third. And that's because they used what mathematicians would do, take the Galerkin projection, take the limit as the projection wave number goes to infinity, but you still end up with this equipartition spectrum, all right? So what we asked was the following question, are there special dimensions where this equipartition spectrum coincides with the Kolmogorov spectrum. That was the genesis. So it was a reasonably crazy idea, which was, I take the Galerkin truncated problem, I know there will be equipartition, but could there be dimensions where you have the cascade solution and the equilibrium solution coexisting with each other? All right? So let's do this exercise, uh, you know, the... the Sort of hand-waving argument is rather simple. It's the following. Suppose you're in dimension D, then if there is energy equipartition, like it would be in 3D, then the equipartition spectrum would be KD minus 1. You want to equate that with Kolmogorov, you end up with a critical dimension of minus 2 third, which, you know, a lot of what uh, this work doesn't make sense physically, but this really doesn't make sense to have a negative dimension. However, if you begin with two-dimensional systems where you have another conserved quantity, namely the entropy, and you play the same game, then you end up with a critical dimension of four-third. What it means is, take the two-dimensional Navier-Stokes equation, project it out in the way I defined, you can continuously reduce the dimension, you'll eventually hit dimension four-third, where you'll continue having the two-dimensional spectrum, kolmogorov kreitman spectrum, but these will be fluxless solutions. So there will be no flux, and it's sort of turbulence in a very synthetic sense. All right? So that was the... Yeah, Nilima, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Of course, I, I said the same. <laughs> so, <laughs> I said the same. But I'll come back later and show some experiments and how, how one can sort of look at that. Exactly. So I, I sort of certainly call this very crazy. This, I say, not so crazy. But I don't rule out the fact that it's crazy. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I'm not going to dwell on this equilibrium solution a lot, except to say that numerically, one is able to actually compute this, go up to this critical dimension, uh, which uh, we did some years ago, and show that, indeed, you have Kolmogorov-like solutions with zero flux. The reason, uh, you know, this is in response to Nilima's question, one of the reasons which drove us in this direction was to say, if at dimension four-third, everything is Gaussian because you're reaching absolute equilibrium, if we have a good handle theory, then could we perturbatively understand two-dimensional turbulence. 
which we don't in its full setting, okay? Through correlation functions, etc. So I'm a little out of, uh, okay. So I, I, I'll skip this, but I'll go back to three-dimensional turbulence and the sort of main <clears throat> question. So this was the setting in which we started to play around with this idea of trying to look at turbulence in non-integer dimensions or on uh, or where the dynamics evolves on a Fourier lattice. Now again, why are we doing it? Uh, just to, you know, so I, I, I'm not really worried if I can get through the results, but just have the basic idea in mind. So in, in the Navier-Stokes equation, we all understand the role of the nonlinear term, all right? In Fourier space, that's a complicated convolution, which involves triads, which have different sort of lengths in each of those triangles, because you're, after all, summing up, uq, where with uh, Fourier modes uh, with wave number P and Q, uh, such that they satisfy a triangular equality of P plus Q equal to uh, K. What's not clear is, are all those triads equally important in understanding what we see in an experiment? After all, I need to connect eventually with experiments, okay? So one way to actually examine that microscopically is to scoop out some of those triads in a self-consistent way, which is the decimation operator I described. Why self-consistent? Again, just to stress, because this operator is really harmless. It doesn't mess up the symmetry of the original problem. It doesn't mess up the conservation laws. All it says is it tries to figure out which parts of that nonlinearity plays an important role in showing you know, the sort of key features of turbulence. All right, so uh, that was sort of 2D. So back to three-dimensional turbulence, just to uh, remind ourselves, we can begin with the Navier-Stokes equation in 3D. Then we choose a projection, a mask, which could be random or a scale-dependent way, which allows you to define a dimension. And then we eventually solve this decimated Navier-Stokes equation. All right, so let's begin with some results before I sort of comment on what they are. So first, let's look at energy spectrum. The energy spectrum, remember, was Kolmogorov, which is scales as k minus 5 third, but with a little correction due to intermittency. So when you actually sort of play this game, and uh, you know, on the left, I'm talking about fractal decimation, so I'm going down in dimension from 3 to 2.8. And here, I'm talking about homogeneous or randomly decimated systems. Again, as one would expect, it doesn't do anything to the energy spectrum. And that's a sort of a secondary check on the fact that your cons uh, conservation laws are valid. But what does it actually do? So, for example, if one were to measure the Eulerian intermittency, remember we started asking about intermittency and the fact that it's really uh, what makes turbulence a very hard problem to look at. What it shows... So, for example, if one were to measure the kurtosis of the Eulerian uh, vorticity field, if it's intermittent in three dimension, that value is much larger than three, all right? If everything was Gaussian, then it would be three, but we know this is from both experiments and simulations, that if you measure this object, the kurtosis, you get a value which is much larger than three. Actually, uh, you know, it scales with Reynolds. Now, the minute you go down in dimensions on the x-axis, on the y-axis, I'm plotting this object. On the x-axis, I'm plotting 3 minus the effective dimension I have. The minute you go down in dimension to even 2.98, you see that the kurtosis immediately starts saturating to 3. So here's a way that I've got rid of intermittency. I, I'm not even claiming to tell you why it appeared in the first place, but I'm giving you a numerical experiment which shows one of the key ingredients which has to be there for the flow to be intermittent. Okay? A, a, a sort of easier illustration is if you just look at the PDF, you see fat tails, but the minute you go down in dimension from three, things collapse to a Gaussian. Uh, this, again, is another way of showing the same thing, where, uh, you know, we club together data from various simulations from, you know, using random decimation, uh, fractal decimation, and all of it suggests the same picture. Start with three dimension, remove some modes from your uh, system, just play with the nonlinearity a little, and you end up getting Gaussian uh, fields everywhere, okay? Uh, 
Sorry? Uh, what do you mean by scale data? Sorry. So I'm plotting this object, the kurtosis, okay, which in three dimension is here. This is the standard value, both experiment simulations. And then I start reducing my dimension, the percentage of modes that I've removed. Okay, so I'm removing 0 0.01, which would be like three or four of those triads. And immediately the kurtosis goes down and settles at the non-intermittent Gaussian signal. Five sets of simulations. Uh, okay, so these are different Reynolds numbers. So these 10, 24, 5, 12 is a surrogate for Reynolds number. It's how big your simulation sizes are. And then this is either fractally done. Remember, we had these two ways of... Uh, there were these two ways I can decimate. One is random homogeneity and the other fractally, where, which allows me to define a sort of quasi-dimension. And here uh, we did uh, several runs in uh, Bangalore and Rome, and this was the sort of clear trend of uh, oil area intermittency suddenly disappearing. Again, just to stress, you know, we are still far from answering the question. Uh, so this is the error bars. So for example, if you look here, this error bar was from simulation and experiment. So it really... With Reynolds, your question is with Reynolds, right? Yeah, with Reynolds, there is a slight scaling in uh, the kurtosis, but not much. It's still in the ballpark of between 13 and 15. I mean, all the available Reynolds we have in wind tunnels and simulations. That's right, that's right. But there is a slight difference which I'll come to at the end, okay? I mean, it really is... Uh, so again, uh, so what I'm not going to speak about here because it's far too technical, this game could be carry, was carried out by us in the Burgers equation, where things can be looked at analytically, and there we did find analytical results confirming why this is happening. Okay, but in Navier Stokes, it's just a, uh, you can't do much more there. Oh, I have some Burgers picture. Okay, I'll come back to it. All right. So that was the Eulerian case. Now, uh, uh, you know, in turbulence, there are two types of uh, ways to analyze flows. One is the Eulerian approach, where you're sitting in the lab and looking at the flow. The other is the Lagrangian approach, where you're following tracer particles along the flow. And both have very dramatic intermittent effects, okay? So then decided, why not look at the Lagrangians, uh, uh, the same analog in the Lagrangian case, where you essentially calculate the velocity difference over time tau, time intervals of a single trajectory, you average over many trajectories, of course, and then, you know, you can define an exponent similar to the Kolmogorov exponent in, which scales as tau. And more precisely, you can define, again, this kurtosis, which is just the fourth by the second squared. You can, you know, use other ways as well. So if you plot this object versus tau, at large tau, they all converge to three. Because if you take velocity differences at over very large times, they're sort of uncorrelated random events, so everything is Gaussian. However, as the time becomes smaller, then in three-dimensional turbulence, this, could, this value is, again, extremely large compared to three. It's actually 80. It's in the ballpark of 75 to 85 amongst all experimental and numerical data that we have. Now I start again decimating, and lo and behold, this again shrinks back to three. Okay? So, uh, so again, a clear signature that playing with the nonlinearity or the a clear sort of indication, hopefully, that if one were to answer the question, what is the origin of intermittency in the Navier-Stokes equation, one probably has to go and look at the structure of the nonlinear term, because this is all it's doing. It's just scooping out some modes and preventing some of these triads from summing up. Okay? Uh, uh, again, as I said, but this, is, this I won't go through, you can sort of do a better job in the one-dimensional Burgers equation because you have a better theoretical handle on the Burgers or KPZ equation, and the message is, uh, is, is, is uh, really the same. Okay. Uh, finally, what was rather interesting is uh, that uh, within certain approximations, there are ways to connect the Eulerian exponents to the Lagrangian exponents, the exponent which is measured as you 
follow the trajectory of a tracer and the exponent that you measure when you're sitting in the lab frame. And these go by the name of linear bridge relations. So uh, Rahul, who spoke uh, a few days ago, Rahul and uh, his former student Ruba, for example, sort of championed this and, and, and did extensive work on actually finding the connection between these Eulerian and uh, Lagrangian exponents. What we see is that although decimation has destroyed everything, the thing that it preserves is this bridge relation. So what I'm showing in this plot without going through the mathematics is that this is the Eulerian exponents. The bridge relations would suggest for it to hold these patches should straddle our data. And that's within Erebus. And this is a case where we find that the bridge relation, the connection between Eulerian and Lagrangian in turbulence is preserved under this sort of rather strange operation. Okay, so I come to the sort of last bits, I'm well in time for questions and discussions, uh, is the issue of, so I, I began by saying that there are probably three major fingerprints. One has to do with intermittency, on which I dwelt the longest. The other two have to do with chaos and uh, irreversibility, something, you know, I'm uh, uh, sort of less familiar with. Okay, so in turbulence, the sort of simplest way in experiments, for example, to measure chaos is what would be called Lagrangian chaos. So in 3D turbulence, you sort of feed the flow in your wind tunnel with traces, and you, uh, you, know, you, you monitor their evolution, and you end up with obtaining the three Lyapunov exponents, which are ordered as such. We, of course, know turbulence is chaotic, so the largest Lyapunov exponent is greater than zero. All right. A measure of irreversibility, and this is again to be taken with some caution, it's just a measure, is to look at the ratio of the middle Lyapunov with the largest Lyapunov. All right? If things were reversible, then the middle one should be identical to zero, and the smallest and the largest should balance each other with opposite signs. So here's a plot from you know, an older paper where you actually show uh, the Lyapunov exponents normalized in a suitable way, I mean, just look at the y-axis that is for finite particles, and you see that this is the ordering. The largest is positive, suitably normalized, scaled. Then there's the middle one, and then there's the negative one. All right? And in general, this object, again, from all possible measurements, this object seems to have a universal value that we do not know why, where it comes from, which is 0.16. Okay. So what does our decimation do to these two objects? So if I look at the largest Lyapunov exponent and plot it as a function of the percentage of modes that I've killed, uh, this blue, sort of pale blue uh, band is, uh, is within Airbus all measured largest Lyapunov exponents which have been measured so far uh, in, in literature. And, and these, are, these symbols are my Lyapunov exponents, are the things that we've measured. We find that the level of chaos is unchanged. Now, that's not, you know, very surprising because it's still a ex very extended dynamical system and you still retain enough Fourier modes. But it's interesting that we went up to, you know, a dimension of point, uh, percentage decimation of 0.5. Uh, so this is sort of just uh, in the, uh, in, uh, just, yeah, just uh, the paper which is due to come out in a week or so. And you see that the level of chaos doesn't change. What about irreversibility? Now, this was rather weird, all right? So when you measured the middle Lyapunov exponent and plotted it, again, this is the pale blue thing, which I don't know how visible that is, but that's the sort of three-dimensional result from all uh, other measurements. Of course, when there's no decimation, we are bang in the middle. As soon as I decimate, it's really a singular sort of behavior. It immediately goes down and sort of my gut feeling is if, if I could extend this x-axis, which numerically is hard to do, this will probably come even more close to zero. Or within error bars, it might straddle zero. So what's happening is that uh, if I were to summarize this, that this way of looking at the Navier-Stokes equation changes two things. One, there's an emergent reversibility in the problem for reasons that we do not understand, and B, the most sort of classic or celebrated feature of turbulent flows, namely intermittency, seems to vanish. Everything becomes Gaussian.
Now, does that necessarily mean an emergent uh, reversibility? I do not know. There is no direct connection. But these are sort of you know, observations which uh, some of us uh, have found interesting to play with, uh, yeah, even if they're not, uh, yeah. So what is the conclusion from this uh, sort of exercise? The first is that we probably have I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm using the word critical with a lot of caution. Uh, we probably have a crossover dimension in turbulence, which is numerically attainable, the dimension four-third that I began with, where everything is Gaussian, but still Kolmogorov. Uh, certainly, there is complete suppression of Eulerian and Lagrangian intermittency the minute you project your solution in this subspace. Uh, and, and the most sort of weird uh, feature uh, that we sort of stumbled upon recently is this uh, emergent reversibility. All right, so the, the last thing that I would say is if you look at this method of dimensional reduction, it's quite generic. And, you know, uh, I'm sort of now trying to be a salesman and, and, and saying that, you know, there could be a whole class of equations if someone's worried about uh, solving equations in non-integer dimensions. This is one way to actually do it, All right? It's a, it's a weird dimension, granted. But this is one way to actually sort of uh, do solve PDEs in, in, in non-integer dimensions. And we are sort of still hoping that the exact results that I talked about at the beginning, which had to do with perturbations around these Gaussian solutions, we are still hopeful that we'll have some of these uh, results in a reasonably finite time. And then, of course, uh, you know, uh, we are not sure what this means for the blow-up problem. Some of us are looking at it at, at the Euler equation and trying to understand if, we, if there is a better way to actually mathematically look at this equation in the subspace and then you know, take the, the, pass it to the Galerkin limit and see what goes on. Okay, I think I'll stop here just to say that thanks to uh, Nilima Pranayamit, etc., I have another talk. Tomorrow will be uh, a little better. It will be about small particles, which I'll pretend to be microorganisms in turbulence and to sort of emerges from those chains and non spherical particles just to advertise for tomorrow. Thanks, I'm done. Yeah. What if you, you took only four modes, say, 0, pi by 2, pi, and 3 pi by 2, say, only four modes if you took, or two modes, whatever, I mean. Well, okay, so that question was uh, answered in the in the Burgers case, where we were able to actually just scoop out one mode. It's on a 1D line, so there's just one K direction. And I scoop out just one mode. And what we saw was that this effect is really singular. So the, the, the sort of features that we are seeing seems to be robust, even for a very small degree of uh, you know, decimation. So even if you took out a few modes, this result would persist. And we went to sort of dimensions 2.99 something, which is similar to what you're saying, just maybe three, four modes were scooped out. In Burgers, of course, it's pathological in the sense, for example, if you begin with, let's say, sine x, and you, by mistake, scooped out k equal to 2, then there would be no dynamics, because the, on the first harmonic it has to excite is k equal to 2 before, uh, and everything would be stuck at sine x. But in higher dimension, you have a bit more freedom. Yeah, but it seems to be a very singular effect. Yeah. Why is it that the uh, non-intermittent characteristic should follow this Gaussian behavior? Sorry? No, the, you said it will lie on a Gaussian curve, right? Uh, uh, yes, for example, if you're looking at velocity differences. So if you, for example, if you, okay, why it should lie is a different thing. So for example, if you take a field, phi, right? And you calculate, let's say, the correlation function of that. Now, if this field is Gaussian, then you know that every higher order correlator, you can connect to the lower order correlator. Or for example, if you calculate the flatness of a field phi, which is Gaussian, you can immediately show in two lines that it has to be equal to three. Okay, so what one observes either directly from measuring the field, that you have fat tails and so large probabilities of, you know, very large events happening, so things are no longer Gaussian, or you can sort of understand it by measuring flatness and you see that they're no longer three anymore. But what we observe is that the minute you play this game, 
everything starts becoming Gaussian. And that's good news because with Gaussian fields, we can probably do a bit more uh, analytics than with fields which, have, which are non-Gaussian and for which actually we have no idea what, uh, what their functional form is. In the table. Okay. okay, thank you. Any further question? If not, let's thank the speaker. Thank you.